Hi, it's me, Josh Carr. Uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about discount rates. Uh, for some reason, the issue of unleveraged versus leveraged discount rates is something a lot of people have a challenge with when talking about real estate investing. Uh, it's probably the same issue when you talk about other kinds of investing, but it's definitely an issue with real estate. So here goes unleveraged versus leveraged discount rates in like, I don't know, a minute or less. Okay. So let's say you've got a stream of income. Dollars times. And let's say as long as we're playing with this, the income goes up over a period of time, and the income is somewhat variable. And to use the real estate parlance, NOI, net operating income. So you've got dollars time, NOI, NOI is variable. And you look at that level of variability and you say, given that level of variability, that level of bounciness, if you will, uh, you want to make a 10% rate of return. Okay, and you know, to sort of push a bit further, uh, when finance people talk about variability, variability is another way of saying risk, uh, another way of saying bounciness, another way of saying the line goes up and down. With things that you're really, really, really sure you're going to get paid on, and it's really, really, really going to be consistent, like say government bonds from a stable country, say, I don't know, the United States, you'd accept a very low rate of return because it's level, it's flat, it's stable, you know you're going to get paid. On things that are all over the place, uh, you know, again, uh, junk bonds, something risky, real estate development, cash flows are variable, I'm not sure you're going to get paid, you want a higher rate of return. Okay. So now let's say we look at this and we say, based on this bounciness, for whatever our reason is, uh, our logic, we want to make a 10% rate of return. Awesome. Now let's say we finance it. DS is for debt service. So now, instead of keeping all the money under the bouncy line, we keep substantially less of the money under the bouncy line. But here's the funny thing. The top line, the net operating income, is still fluctuating. But now, instead of fluctuating over a lot of money, it's fluctuating over a much smaller chunk of money, right? That little chunk of money. Which means, in essence, the cash flows have become more variable. In other words, it's riskier. In other words, we need a higher discount rate. And that's pretty much it about it. One of the reasons I go through this is because whenever I'm teaching and I say, hey, leveraged discount rates are higher than unleveraged, someone invariably always says back at their first response, oh, you mean because you could get foreclosed on and lose the building? And I say, no, it's more basic than that. It's not that you could lose the building. I mean, yeah, that's a factor. But the primary issue, the, the first issue, is that the cash flows are more variable if you borrow money. Because uh, again, top line still bouncy over less money than what you've had before. So the act of borrowing money makes the cash flows more variable, which means it's riskier, which means you need a higher discount rate. Now, usually when I go through all this, the immediate next thing is by how much, right? Like how much riskier? And I hate rules of thumb, but at least in my experience, what I tend to see in the marketplace is if someone has an unleveraged rate of, say, 8% that they want to make, you see leveraged discount rates at around 50% higher than unleveraged, assuming normal institutional quality financing. So when you're dealing with 70% LTV, 75% LTV, the same guy who says he wants to make 10% on an unleveraged basis probably wants to make it out of 15 on a leveraged, eight becomes a 12, you get the idea. And again, that's just based on what I tend to see in the market. That's not a rule of thumb, it's just kind of what people tend to up the target by assuming 70, 75% financing. Now the more interesting question for me is, what about if instead of borrowing 70% of the money, you borrow 80, borrow 90%, you have, less and less money, top line is still variable, the possibility NOI will drop below debt service, and you'll have a cash flow shortfall that becomes bigger and bigger. What target rates to use there? That's hard, right? Because it's all fine and good to say, eight unleveraged gets you 12 leveraged. What about if you borrow 90% of the money? Do you want a 15? Do you want a 20? What do you want? And what's your data point? What's your justification? 
you could have two intelligent, honest, freely speaking people where one comes up with a 15 and one comes up with a 20 and they can both back up their logic and no one really knows. Uh, it becomes kind of a crapshoot, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, and I find that a lot of these conversations about discount rates rapidly devolve into the conversations of almost like faith. It's matters of belief. Do you believe cash flows always go up, which is a statement of madness, but people would say that uh, during the run-up pre-financial crisis. The logic that somehow you can borrow unlimited amounts of money because things are never going to be a problem. Um, again, I, I think that's an act of madness. Okay, well, that's what I have to say about that. That's unleveraged versus leveraged discount rates. Thanks. And again, that was Josh Carr. Uh, our, my website is carrealestate.com, K-A-H-R, realestate.com.